Last night I went out to eat some pinchos with my wife who's sitting in the audience and I would like to recommend that as the final bit because I'm sure that you've already gone to uh, pinchos. All you have to do is platform where you're on the left. But when you go out for pinchos and you ask what you had for dinner, it's very difficult to answer because it happens that you can't say or you can't even say fish or meat. Who knows? And I thought that right here now, everybody, or at least uh, myself, I had the feeling of eating pinchos for five days. And it's true, because we have been eating pinchos for five days. And one has his head hot, but the feet very cold. And it's a bit of a mental mess, uh, full of ideas. And I arrived yesterday, and I have that feeling. So those of you that have been here for five days, I can imagine that you must feel terrible by now. But anyway, so this is why we're holding this session. This session that has to do with uh, don't um, have any doubts or don't leave with any doubt without, without with any doubts in your mind. And I think that the challenge, what we have to do is now to take away a couple of ideas, very specific ideas, take them back home with you so that you can clarify all of these uh, comments and remarks that have been made here. Because now, when in a few hours and after the uh, presentation to be given by Montserrat del Pozo, everything comes to a close, we can say that everything starts. But as long as we do things properly, because now everything starts. And I would like to take the opportunity to invite you all to explore a space that we have set into motion from the Magisterio Journal that is called ENIAC. ENIAC is uh, the acronym of the first computer ever to be built, ENIAC. Nearly 70 years have gone by since that computer was made, and it's a space for reflection, a space for debate, so that ICOT can continue with this forum, and I'm sure that you'll find resources and experiences and many other things. The ENIAC space, ENIAC.com. So I would like to invite you to visit it, although you will receive it together with a copy of Magisterio every month. And that's it from me. So we've got to get going with the format. We have eight pinchos, right? Eight pinchos to continue with that simony. We have eight pinchos, and uh, they've already been introduced. But I would like to focus on, and I would like to ask for a very strong round of applause, one very heartfelt applause for two people that are sitting here amongst us on both ends. One of them is Ana Pérez from the COAS group and Javier Baón from Tu Innovas. And, well, they were courageous enough to act in the Bilbao style, you know, as a show-off, as it were. So they brought ICOT all the way to Bilbao, all the way to Spain. So let's have a very strong round of applause for both of them, please. And if anybody on the stage is listening to this translation into English, it would be wonderful for them to be given headsets so that they can follow what's going on, because um, most of this is going to be in Spanish. That's just a suggestion. But I would just like to remind you very briefly, well, just with a very quick word, I would like to remind you about one of the main areas of research of each one of the individuals that are sitting here with us this afternoon so that you can put questions to them, which is what this is all about. You have to put questions to them. And also through the hashtag, through ICOT, you can ask your questions that I will look up from the tablet. But we have Javier Romero here with us, who's uh, dealing with uh, musical education. We'll leave it at that, but let's say that it's a musical education. We have Bruno de la Chiesa, Bruno de la Chiesa Neuroscience. Well, there are more things, but apart from that. But anyway, I'm just saying this so that we can focus the discussion a little bit, as well as your comments and remarks. And I forget about Javier Baon, uh, multiple intelligence, managing difference. And we have here uh, Karen Morrison, who works on visible thought. Sitting to my right is Ana Maria Fernandez, that is uh, education for children and families. And then you can say whatever you want later on, okay? And we have with us Bill Martin, who focuses on leadership and organization. We have uh, Brendan Splain, coaching, leadership also. 
And we have Anna Bereth with us, who's a linguist, and the importance that language has and the importance of thought. And from now on, please uh, sharpen your um, minds, and this is the time for your questions. And to break the ice, as it were, I would like to uh, throw a couple of questions at you, some of the questions that have been um, written on the post-its outside in the lobby. And I would like to open fire with uh, Brendan. Oh, somebody's going to translate for Brendan there, sitting next to him. Well, whatever. But anyway, uh, there was a lecture that Brendan gave that I found uh, was uh, very interesting, which was my take-home message. And the, he said that the key for leadership was the following, that everybody, everybody is uh, fighting a battle. And his recommendation was that in that battle, that you always have to be kind. You always have to be kind. In other words, kindness. I personally must confess that this is what I'm going to take home with me from Michael. Always be kind. And we would like Brendan. We would like Brendan to elaborate on that idea, please. Everyone is fighting a battle you know nothing about. Be kind always. This was said to me two weeks ago by the person that had been nominated by his peers as the most influential person in their industry in that country. This was a person who had great impact. This was a person, though, who had to do very difficult things, have performance conversations, tell people that they needed to leave their work. He, he had tough, tough things to do. And yet, when he spoke about his work and his ethic and his aspiration, that was his guiding mantra. That was his guiding light. The group were not expecting to hear that. The group were expecting to hear something more technical, something more um, performance driven. Um, and yet the moment he said it, everybody understood why he was so influential. The word kindness is such an important word because it reminds us that we are of one kind. We are family. And that as human beings, there is far more that connects us than there is that separates us. And yet sometimes we seem to see only what's different and not what's the same. So his capacity to talk at that level of um, we are one was one of the most transformative things that people experienced with him and his work. Is that okay? I don't know if there are any questions, but if not, I will carry on with the questions that I have in mind here and uh, that have uh, reached us through the post-its. I have another question here. Another question from one of the uh, school principals, Ana Maria Fernandez. And this lady is asking, how can you involve families in the thinking um, culture of a school? I would, hello. Well, the first thing, the first thing is that we have to understand that when we talk about thinking culture, we are not going to be a thinking culture for other people, but rather when I'm going to be talking about a thinking culture, I'm the first person that has to change that culture. So how can we engage the parents? How can we engage the families? Well, by telling them, by telling them that education that is a shared responsibility and by inviting the parents to become involved in each of the events that we hold at schools where parents participate, we have to make sure that the objective is very clear, that intentionally we are using uh, tools geared towards uh, the thinking techniques, and they also have to form part of that 
thought language that is used at school so that we can um, transfer that as much as we possibly can. But how can we engage them by listening to them and by opening up spaces for them at schools where they can come and share their experiences, where they can come and also ask their questions? And how can we make them become engaged? We always talk about... Uh, the three fingers. One points to the f parents uh, and the other fingers point to the family. And there's the third finger that points to me. What can I do to see you differently? What can I do to avoid judging you and seeing you as a parent that is also undergoing a process in which you're discovering your child and a changing world, a world full of challenges? So firstly, we have to understand how we are adding value and perhaps let's say hope that we are wise in the way we create these contexts in which parents can become involved. And it's not only the parents, it's also the brothers and the grandparents in the community at large. So I think that, well, we have to open up spaces and we all have to understand this ourselves. Do you have any questions? Uh, do you have any questions? Are you ready to go? Are you ready to throw your questions at the speakers? Not yet? Well, okay. Well, I have another question here, and this is for Karen Morrison. And, well, there is there is translation into English, uh, simultaneous translation, that is, but nobody can think. How can you give more energy to our dreams, more than to our fears? I'm not sure. Well, somebody perhaps will have to translate. how to give more energy to much more energy to our dreams than our fears thank you well um, it's not directly related to the topic but in a way it is Lyndon just said about being kind to other people I carry with me all the time I know you can't see it back there but this is the back of my phone and it's it's a child's drawing of a face and underneath it says be good to other people in a child's writing and I think if you keep things like that in mind all the time it's doing things for good um, it helps you get energy when things are frightening, even when things are difficult, if you can look forward as positively as you can, reframe things, find other people that you can talk to who trust you or who you trust that you can talk about your fears to. Everybody has fears. Everybody does. Life is complex, and, but if we let them overwhelm us, it can paralyze us. But if we can move forward and really follow our dreams, follow our beliefs as much as we can, and find other people with similar ideas, they can give us energy too. And really trust and collaboration and belief in what you're doing can really help energize you and move forward away from the fear. Thank you. There's a question here now for Bill Martin. Or perhaps somebody can translate from the stage. I'm a school principal, and uh, what sort of advice would you give me to improve um, people management? The best thing that a rector of a school can do to help improve the school is to get everyone who works in their school to know who they are, know what they stand for. Teaching is the most noblest of profession, and I love people who teach. All over the world, teachers go into classrooms and do the best they can whatever the resources, whatever their um, skills are to, to teach the children assigned to them. And as they teach throughout the year, those children leave them. Long after, long after the children forget what the teachers taught them, they remember the teacher. They remember the teacher. I can remember the best teachers of my life. I know their names and faces. I can remember the worst teachers of my life. I know their names and faces. 
The ones in the middle are a little foggy. But I would ask you if you teach, what picture of you will children carry with them the rest of their lives? Your rector needs to help you know what picture you paint as you work with children. Well, this is a question for Javier Romero now, and a question had to come your way, of course, Javier. Well, this is a very interesting question for you, and in particular for those of us that work for the printed uh, media, and everybody talks about Finland, Finland, and Finland all the time. So we're looking for model models in the north or in the south. Finland or Africa, where do we have to go for the models? Where do we have to go for the models? The north or the south? Finland or Africa? Everybody's looking for models. Well, hello, good afternoon, everybody. We have a pretty clear-cut idea, and the model to be followed is not Finland, it is Africa, uh, very clearly, because of something that is crystal clear, and it's the model where we have to do that uh, work, uh, what uh, things that we have to share, and with uh, lots of students and from different spheres, where uh, games are always present, and where there's much something much more important in the culture in which the concept of intelligence, and even with music, Everything is from the neck upwards. It's all in the head. But from downwards, where are the feelings? Where are the expressions? Where's the internalization? Where's the communication? Where's the fact that you reach out to so many people? And for us, it is very important for the body to be able to uh, establish extensive contact, not only from a rational and cognitive perspective, but also from an experimental perspective, so that we can internalize each and every one of those issues when I try to become entrenched in the public. And Lowen said that the three forms are always through your gaze, through your hands, and your feet. And if I don't look at you, and if I don't touch you, and if I don't move in order to be able to look at you again, and touch again, and so on and so forth, we'll never be able to establish a tribe. So we need... Uh, Everybody in this pro in this process, so primary educators, secondary educators, people that music schools, so that we can declassify those roles in which we all are supposed to be classified by ages or by our uniforms or by our time schedules. But there are spaces that are very important, and we are all in favour of games. Games are very important because this is an indirect manner of feeling well, of uh, transmitting many values, and not only from a rational and cognitive point of view, but also through wonderful feelings and from feeling or making somebody feel well, feel comfortable. And we're not going to be reminded uh, based on our cognitive aspect, but rather how we've made somebody feel, that person we have in front of us. So this is why what we always say, because the model is perhaps not Finland, it could be Africa, why not? I knew you were going to like that. Bruno de la Chiesa says uh, that he's of uh, uh, Italian, French and German origin. You'll explain how this is possible. It seems almost impossible. And he describes themselves as a busy cosmopolitan. That's what they've written down here about you. And uh, about this, uh, it's a very pertinent question or a very impertinent question, depending on how you look at it. Because uh, a teacher asks, will the time come when a European uh, manage three or four languages to form a more connected Europe. There it is. A ver. Pues para empezar, según un amigo. Well, to begin, according to a friend in London, in a fairly near future. Only people that will be monolingual on this planet will be the Anglo-Saxons. In other words, if David Cameron is successful with his referendum and we have a, a Britsit, it's possible that in the future we will have a truly uh, multilingual Europe in the future. If the United Kingdom stays in, it's something else. 
No, now seriously. In Europe, not to mention the United States, a monolingual is uh, the exception more than the rule on this planet. In Africa, for example, as uh, you were saying, there aren't uh, too many people that are monolingual. So uh, plurilingualism, pluriculturalism is uh, a reality today for most human beings. But uh, if I may answer the question, I find this uh, very hard to say, but I'm very disappointed with Europe. I still feel very European, as you said. I have Italian blood, German and French blood in my veins. And I've had the fabulous opportunity of living in France, in Germany and in other countries in Europe and uh, outside Europe, abroad. I've lived in Latin America, I've lived in the Middle East, I've lived in the United States, and now in Asia. As a friend of mine said from Egypt, a uh, Jesuit father, 30 uh, years ago, for me it was like an eye-opener. Uh, he was talking to a lot of compatriots. I was the only non-Egyptian in the room. And uh, he asked, uh, do you want to know what uh, Egypt is? And the participants looked at each other and said, uh, what's he talking about? We're Egyptian. We know what Egypt is. And he said, no. If you want to know what Egypt is, you have to go abroad. Go to Europe, go to North America, to Australia, anywhere. When you come back, one or two years later, you're going to know what Egypt is because a fish doesn't know what water is. And this was uh, 30 years ago, in 1985. And as the only non-Egyptian in the room, but living in Egypt then, uh, I felt that he was also uh, talking about me. I wasn't trying to understand Egypt. It was too strange for me. But that's uh, the time when I started to realize uh, what it means uh, to be a Western European. Because I wasn't in my original waters, let's say. Now, being connected in Europe, uh, well, uh, that's fine, but it seems uh, that uh, Europeans uh, don't uh, understand each other in many areas. But uh, 10 years ago, I was uh, a bit uh, disappointed uh, with Europe, and now I uh, think uh, differently. I'm not a, a European, no, I'm not French or German either. I'm like uh, each one of us here. Above all, I'm a human being. And yes, we have to be connected. But of course, uh, we shouldn't establish uh, privileges in the connections uh, between uh, European countries or between uh, Western countries. Uh, we need to open up communication to cognitive justice. In other words, connect uh, with uh, cultures, uh, with other human groups uh, that are not Western. Perhaps uh, they, in cooperation with us, and I agree with you, have the key to the future. If there's something that uh, I'm absolutely certain about as a European and uh, a Western man, is uh, that we alone in the West uh, don't have the key to the future. We don't even have the key to the past, as George Orwell said. Well, you know, the future is the connection between human beings in a very general way. 
we have a fantastic diversity. As I said uh, during my presentations, human diversity forms part of the wealth of our species. How do you say it? We uh, shouldn't undervalue it, underestimate it. But uh, what we have in common is much more important than our differences. Very good. Well, we're going to finish uh, the round. Uh, we have uh, two pinchos that haven't uh, taken part yet. The question is for Ana Pérez. Do you have any evidence that the improvement in uh, thinking skills, empirical evidence, improvements in thinking skills uh, help uh, to improve uh, your command of languages or your knowledge of languages? Bueno, esta... Well, uh, this is a more technical question. And uh, yes, thinking skills, uh, thinking routines, everything that uh, surrounds uh, visible thinking, the mind habits, all these uh, frameworks brought into the uh, language curriculum or into the uh, subject matter curriculum or into the various uh, areas uh, taught uh, in uh, the non-native uh, language indicates uh, improve uh, the language skills. I think that uh, Ana Maria can also uh, tell us about it because she sees it at schools. Why? Well, because uh, thinking and language uh, are absolutely interrelated to the degree that uh, our students uh, grow in the development of uh, critical, creative, uh, strategic thinking to the extent uh, that uh, teachers uh, change uh, the way of questioning, of asking questions, when there is a different uh, kind of dialogue in the classroom, this has an influence on the use of language. And to the extent that through uh, thinking skills, routines, habits, etc., we uh, promote uh, reading comprehension, reading expression, uh, verbal expression, written production, uh, oral production. All this uh, is uh, going to improve uh, communication skills, not only in languages two, three, and four, but uh, also in the native language. I think uh, this is a point uh, where we ought to stop and uh, think. And here in the Basque uh, country, we have a, a plurilingual vocation. We want uh, the future generations uh, to speak uh, Basque, to speak Basque properly, to speak uh, Spanish, uh, to speak English, to speak uh, another European language, or perhaps uh, an Asian language. But we want them uh, to be plurilingual. And I think that we need to stop and think about what these routines all these uh, tools can contribute to improve uh, communication skills in all languages at the school, including the native language. And finally, I spoke too long as usual and I haven't answered the question. What uh, evidence? Well, uh, there is evidence in uh, the United States at uh, bilingual schools, uh, Spanish, uh, English, where these procedures are carried out, it has been found that there is an improvement in language. TBL people, for example, with the native language in the United States, also evidence that English uh, has improved greatly at 
not at uh, plurilingual schools, but uh, in relation to the native language. We at COAS, we're finding that it's a great help. Our school is trilingual, well, plurilingual, Basque, English, uh, Spanish, uh, with the same uh, time spent on them. In secondary school, we start with French, and uh, we're seeing that uh, production and uh, comprehension is improving. We have to do a lot more, but uh, we do have evidence, and uh, people from uh, visible thinking in Europe are also finding this. This is what I can say. Thank you. Anna wanted to contribute something very briefly. Because, uh, from now on, since we're running out of time and uh, I want to leave uh, time for questions, we have to uh, use the rule, don't, so, don't say anything that uh, won't fit in a headline. So p please be brief in your answers from now on so that we can have some questions. But before handing over to you, I wanted to uh, say something about what Anna said. If uh, this is the way things are, why is there this usual practice at schools of uh, lowering the uh, bilingual or trilingual uh, level in secondary school when things uh, seem to uh, get serious and knowledge acquisition is the priority? Then they say, well, let's uh, forget about bilingualism. I've heard this, and I'm sure you've heard this too, because now it's a matter of getting the children to learn because uh, they have to take their uh, university entrance exam. Is uh, that a bad practice? What do you think? Well, uh, I think that uh, from uh, first year of primary school to uh, baccalaureate, uh, there is uh, a uh, gap and I think that we could uh, do uh, uh, a great deal in preschool and uh, primary school, but by changing the methodology, by changing the classroom discourse, uh, by uh, working on interesting things uh, in the language. I don't know, I'm getting into a muddle. How do you say challenge in Spanish, she's asking? <laughs> what uh, interesting uh, challenges may be uh, for students, but uh, from the time they're very small, proposing uh, highly significant activities. If we build uh, from the bottom and we continue in uh, primary education, the fluency of uh, children in secondary school will be much greater. I think it's terrible that uh, they're still working on the verb to be in secondary school and that so much time has been wasted. All the thinking skills, uh, all this we've been learning during this conference has to be uh, taken to uh, the classroom in the uh, non-native language and also in the native language. Uh, because the vocabulary in the native language, uh, expression in the native language is extremely poor in our students. So all this has to be taken f to the classroom from the time they're very young and continue to build on that. And uh, that's uh, not a problem. And I'm sorry, uh, again, I spoke too long. I think that the only thing I wanted to add evidence about uh, whether the uh, strategies and routines uh, work and uh, how can uh, language be improved. And the only thing I would like to say that, uh, uh, yes, of course it does, but it depends on the context. If I uh, do it just for the sake of doing it, no. But if I have a clear purpose, and what you said, Anna, is uh, what I wanted to say. If uh, it's done in a significant way, well, this means that students talk to each other, they contribute things to each other, there's a need to communicate, and not just uh, in the verbal language, through arts, through other forms of expression. 
So I think the first is to have a very clear purpose uh, of uh, what we're generating in the context and use the strategies, use the routines, use the skills uh, that help uh, to uh, order uh, expression and thinking. We have a question. Microphone, please. Hello, I'm from Argentina. So uh, Latin America is in my skin. And Bruno, you used a concept which I think is extremely interesting, which is uh, cognitive justice. And bearing in mind uh, the rights, the right to this, what do you say to politicians in Latin America or in other countries? Because we talk a lot about Europe, the United States. What would you say to uh, politicians? Because we talk about schools, uh, but uh, we have to look beyond schools. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for the question. Uh, one minute, 30 seconds. In my experience, uh, there is nothing to be expected from politicians. I'm sorry, it sounds a bit populist, but when it's a matter of educating and improving education, we know that we work for our children and the children of our children. In other words, any reform, any uh, thing that's new is going to have an impact in 10, 15, 20 years' time. And practically all politicians I've met so far in any country in the world are only interested in their next re-election, which is never that far away. Something else regarding cognitive justice. It's a matter of uh, opening up uh, the uh, construction of knowledge to non-Western uh, approaches. In other words, taking away the ethnocentricity we all have, etc., etc. And we can only uh, do that on a grassroots level at our grassroots levels as educators, as parents, as citizens, and then uh, take the pressure up because it's never going to happen in the other direction. I just on that. Another thing we need to be wary of is cognitive entrenchment. Some people stay in the same spot. They don't change their thinking. They don't move their thoughts. They say what they've always said, do what they always do. How can we get them out of those trenches and open their ears and eyes to a wider world and different opinions? I think that's a big question for politicians and a lot of other people too. Cognitive entrenchment's not a good thing. Preguntas, allí. Questions, over there. Hello, can you hear me? The change from the bottom. Teachers have that responsibility as well as many other responsibilities. And uh, the question was partly answered by saying that the change has to come from the bottom. But my question is, wouldn't it be better for that uh, change to come from the bottom and the top and meet in the middle? And I would also like to know what the participation of the administration is and the commitment of the administration and the institutions at this event. Who's the question for? For whoever would like to answer. The administration, if it's here. Who would like to pick up the glove? Um. Why, why do we separate ourselves so much? The administration are people. They have children, they have grandchildren, and we talk about each other at times as if we were different species. Uh, what I was trying to say last night in the keynote is that we have to find wiser ways of being together. We have to find ways to flatten our dialogue space so that we can meet as people and not as positions. When we meet wisely as people, the dichotomies, the polarities, uh, the differences appear to be there between us because of our badges and our positions. Uh, many of those things dissolve. 
So I, my, my sense is that as a human species, we need to gather more wisely uh, and find a way to talk to each other and not at each other. And I believe that can be done, uh, but I think it takes new technologies that currently exist, but we haven't explored. The outside systems that you talk about when I was in schools never came into my schools. We brought it in ourselves and worried about it, whinged about it, and moaned about it, but the systems never came in. That's why when I look at schools around the world, the ones who are doing the best are where the rector and the people who live in that school realize that their most valuable resource is the live lives of the people in that school. If we trust what we've learned living a life together and use that, we become a massive force for teaching and learning. So don't worry about the outside system. It's always there. But they don't come into your place. You bring it in with you, with your fears and your worries and your whinging and moaning. And that's a waste of time. Believe in yourselves. Take everything you've learned in your life together out and say, let's do something together and move forward. And you could change the world. Aquí delante. Perfecto. In the front here. Perfect. Here's the microphone. Uh, Javier, you're not going to get out of this alive. You haven't spoken yet. Javier, oh, look. I had another one. I'm going to make ask this question to Brendan. Sorry, Brendan. What can we do to make this conference smarter and to avoid the traps of the egos and the vanities that destroy good conferences, good organizations, good intentions and purposes? Um, Gilberto, that can't be answered in a headline. <laughs> it's a powerful question. Um, the, an American negotiator was sitting beside his mother who was dying of cancer in a hospital in Arizona and he got a call from the White House to ask if he would go and negotiate between the Chechens and the Russians, who were having great antipathy. And he asked his mother, should he go? And she said, yes, that's an important place. They're important people. And even though you're my son and you're here with me now, you should go. He tells the story that on the first night after a horrible day's conference, where these people wanted to kill each other, where they sat at the other side of the table and if the table hadn't been there, they would have killed each other. And that night he had to host a dinner. He had to propose a toast. And what he did, he said, when I got the call to come here, I was sitting beside my mother's bed. Uh, she's dying of cancer. And she told me I should come here. And he said, I raise my glass to mothers. And in the room, he says, the energy changed. Because instead of Chechens and Russians, there were the sons of mothers. So I, I think we can find ways to that place, Gilberto. I'm not sure if I've answered, or partly answered your question, but I think we can find different ways to see each other and to talk to each other. And when we do, we remember we are the sons and daughters of mothers, the fathers and mothers of children, people who are trying to make sense of this little thing we call life that's perched between one long sleep before we were born and another long sleep 
after we die and all of us are trying to make sense of the bit in the middle. That, that's my friend's very deep and thoughtful answer. If you want to make something of the conference and you want to sustain this conference, I'll give you a simpler answer. In Spanish, do you know what this is? In America, we call it a bum. All you need to go do is when you go home today, get off your bum and do something that you learned at the conference and it will go on forever. something very briefly as a member of the International Standing Committee for these conferences. First of all, oh, I beg your pardon. As a member of the International Standing Committee for these conferences, I want to tell you that we're very open to your ideas and thoughts. These conferences, 2,000 people have come here now. There is so much that people want to be here for, and it continues in ways to grow and evolve. But we also know that we constantly have to review and look at the way things are going. The world is changing. The complexities are overwhelming for all of us in many ways, but there are ways forward. Today, Bengt, one of the members of the Standing Committee, had a session about how can we reinvigorate, regenerate the conference in different ways to meet these needs. The International Standing Committee met yesterday to discuss these very things. What can we do to go even deeper, even broader? What other, how can we bring more, perhaps, controversy into it to hear different opinions and different things? We want it to continue the wonderful ways it has over the last 43 years and continue further to help build the world, the, the way people are making decisions, thinking about the problems of the world and finding ways forward in positive ways. And your ideas and your thoughts and suggestions will help us too. So please don't hesitate in contacting any of us, letting us know what your thoughts are about this. We all want to get together in a few years' time and see a whole new look of ICOT, as one has always been, valuing the past and all it has done, but also navigating our way forward into the future together. Thank you. This Después de escuchar a Brenda, well, after listening to Brenda, this uh, conference started as a conference on innovation. It seems that it's going to finish as if it were a conference on humanism. That is a very interesting thing, I believe. Javier, Javier, you're not going to get out of this one, I'm afraid. I have one question, no, several questions, but I'm going to, going to ask you one. One piece of advice uh, to manage the difference can a teacher reduce the deficiencies or shortcomings of an educational system, a homogenizing educational system? Well, some of you that already know me are possibly, you possibly know that uh, you have to remember the parts of the different components of a fruit. So could you please name the three parts of a fruit? So it's the skin, that is what you eat, and then you have the bone inside. But I, well, they call it epicarpium, mesocarpium, but anyway, but practically nobody remembers that information anymore. Practically nobody remembers the um, difference between a cataphoric and an anaphoric pronoun but that does exist too. I don't know how many people, how many people usually calculate the common uh, minimum multiple every day. And we cannot fool ourselves any longer. This is not about learning. And we all know that, of course, because I have more doubts. And here today are the people that can actually answer, because I usually ask people, what about on the other side of planet Earth? and today they are here today, does it rain upwards? What about the equator? Does it rain inwards? And the funny thing is that as adults we have no sophisticated words to explain this in most instances. This is not learning. So we can fool ourselves if we want because uh, it works well as regards 
not um, sitting exams, but this is not learning. And this is something you can feel when you become an adult. Yes, of course, learning and everybody has to learn. I still remember a story because I have two children and when the gynecologist um, got to know us better and what he took out of the drawer, he took out a little black book, a little black exercise book, and he said, here, I take note of all those cases of the babies that died, and I analyze this a lot, and I review this a lot too, because we should have uh, the same kind of exercise book for each uh, pupil that leaves, because lots of pupils leave, and perhaps, and perhaps the best leave or perhaps amongst those that leave are the best. And those that do not uh, draw the circle from inside, from the beginning, because this is what our method does. It homogenizes us. It manages, it makes us all do exactly the same thing at the same time. But that product is practically of no use whatsoever. And it so happens that uh, children have rights and that we people need the children and we also need to have the potential that each one of these children has to offer and it so happens that we are making more and more poor because we don't know how to make use of the diverse potential of individuals because we are bent on homogenizing whatever we do in the classroom because that is much more comfortable but this is like destroying the potentiality of difference. And I said this on day one, when I believe that we all enjoy a lot when we saw that performance, because we need all human capabilities. But schools have decided that some of them are first-class capabilities and others are second and even third-class capabilities, or some of them are even rated as distractions, but this is false. And we know that this is false when we become adults because we need all of those areas. And it can't be that the system called calls children failures. We can call the system itself a failure because out of each individual, it doesn't manage to bring out the strengths or the things that are going to make them happy. Whatever makes a people and a city and a world that is much more powerful and much more happy. One more? Or, well, it has to be the very last one because there's a hand, but it has to be a, a real good one this time because it's going to be the last contribution. Thank you very much. My name is Christian Camilo and I'm from Colombia. The question that I have is that we've all heard about a premise or something that is very beautiful that it says that I think, therefore, I exist. But unfortunately, in many contexts, in many countries where violence plays a, an outstanding role, it seems that this sentence has become transformed. And the thing is that I think and therefore I die because uh, making a social critique involves uh, a risk for your life. So what would any of you say to somebody who enjoys uh, reconsidering the um, forms that the social system is using, but who doesn't really want to say anything just because that person is afraid because he could lose his life or because he could be threatened. What would you say about that? And what would this person have to do if he can't speak up? The Colombian. Or from one Colombian to another Colombian, question over to you. Well, you've uh, really touched my soul with that question because uh, we are both from the same country and I know where your question comes from. What I would tell that person, and this is something we've already spoken about many a times at the ministry, but we would say, what is your ultimate objective in life in what you're doing? So how can you add value? How can you join up with others that also want to add value? And how can you say this? Because there are many ways of saying things. Sometimes we say them and we make mistakes and we attack, but there are more beautiful ways of saying things so that things can reach people. There are lots of contexts in our countries in which changes have been implemented where those that kill and those that are violent 
and I'm currently working in Cartagena at a school where those that kill are violent. And they have understood that my child could experience a different reality. So I'm going to sign a non-aggression agreement in three kilometers around the school where my child goes to so that I don't kill the parents because we usually kill each other. So what I would say is that if we want to um, produce better citizens for the world, we have to speak to each other because, as uh, Bruno Compassion said, the change is within ourselves and we have to stop putting the blame on other people because if I don't speak, if I don't do anything, if I don't start today, in 20 years we're going to be very sorry for what we didn't do today and we're going to be looking towards the past, which is what has happened to us. So we have to speak you can say things and you can also find the necessary means to solve this problem. So in other words, there has to be an invitation to reflect upon all these issues. Right, okay, well, I'm afraid that uh, we couldn't finish on a much more better note than that with these uh, very heartfelt words. words. And that's all. I would just like to hope you wish you the very best and you take home some very specific things but we are the curtain raisers of Montserrat del Pozo who will be speaking right now just after this panel discussion thank you very much